Hi. <laughs> Welcome to this video. Um, if you clicked on it, you know why we're here. We are going to be doing a plot summary video for the mortal instruments. How do I start this? So if you are completely brand new, okay, don't have any idea what you have just stepped into. Let me explain just a little bit. So the author of this particular series, Cassandra Clare, created a world called the Shadow Hunter world and within this world she wrote a bunch of different series that are sort of interconnected occasionally you will hear of a character from this series in another series etc it's kind of fun and they span centuries hundreds of years like three four generations this is technically the first one this is called the mortal instruments this was her first traditionally published work she comes from the fan fiction world she comes from the harry potter fan fiction world i'm not gonna go into it her books continuously get better this uh, series um is sort of a mess it's really really long hence why i'm doing this plot breakdown video technically if you're reading them like in publication order you do need to read this series first my general opinion is you can dive into the shadow hunter world without reading this book but the reason i want to cover this book is that it is a hot topic there is a certain plot line a little thread in here that is questionable and it's kind of part of the cultural conversation when it comes to the book world specifically YA fantasy book world and so if you want to know the actual plot you want to understand what people are talking about but you don't want to read the books that's why I'm here and have I seen the movie in theaters like seven times you betcha do I watch it every single year Mm -hmm. But that's basically what this series of videos is for. I've done a few of the Sarah J Mass books, basically books that are a huge part of the kind of cultural conversation, but whether it's you don't want to support the author, whether you don't have time, whether you just need something to put on in the background while you clean, I'm making these videos for you so that you can know the plot without having to carry like books. These books are thick. So today we are only covering the first book. Today. I'm going to film this over many days. In this video, we're only going to be covering the first book. I have yet to write the script for the next videos, but I have a feeling I'm going to try and combine the books. But just today, we're going to talk about The Mortal Instruments, book one, City of Bones. I'm so excited. Here we go. Also, it's rainy season here in Seoul, so apologies for the light it's not going to change for a couple months, so this is what we've got. Part 1, Dark Descent. <laughs> Our story begins at Pandemonium, an all-ages nightclub, where we meet Clary and Simon, 15-year-olds who want to party. Quote, they were dancing, or what passed for it. A lot of swaying back and forth with occasional lunges towards the floor as if one of them had dropped a contact lens. Somebody call now. <laughs> okay. Simon is Clary's best friend. Clary, spoiler, she's our main character, okay? They live in New York City and they want a night of adventure at pandemonium. Clary is distracted though because she is paying attention to someone walking through the crowd and it's this cute guy with blue hair, all right? Throughout the book, we are going to see that Simon just talks to himself. I love Simon, like full, I'm fully biased here. I love Simon. Um, he is the character that says things and Clary's very distracted and it's just like, huh? What? What? All the time? Um, so thoughts and prayers to Simon this whole series, man. Here we go. So he's, you know, like dancing. He's like, man, Clary, this DJ's great. And Clary is just not there. She's watching Blue Haired Boy. And she's kind of like, oh, bummer, because he goes up to this girl, looks like they're a little friendly. And she's like extra damn because then they start heading to the back room for some privacy. She kind of starts to turn back to Simon. She's like, okay, blue haired boy off the table. Let me talk to my best friend who I've been ignoring all night. When she notices blue haired boy and his little girlfriend are being followed. It's two boys and she looks a little closer. One is blonde, one has dark hair. And as she's kind of like, what the fuck? That's weird. Blondie pulls out a knife. Clary is like, holy shit, Simon, do you see that? And Simon, who has very bad eyesight, says, no. <laughs> Clary is like, I just saw a guy pull out a knife. 
Simon, the only sane person in this club, is like, okay, wait here, I'm gonna go get a security guard. Keep your eyes on him. Clary follows the guy with the knife. Now we switch and we start to see things from blue haired boy's point of view. And we very quickly realize he's not a boy. <laughs> he is referencing humans in the way that no human would say, you know, like, oh, look at all these humans. Humans don't say that shit. So we know he's not, whatever he is, he's not human, okay? Him and his little girlfriend start getting a little cozy in the back room when he notices she's covered in tattoos, which to me, I'm like, I'm more interested, but for him, he's like, he <sighs> and backs away. But before he can get too far, he quote, receives a blow to the chest that would have sent him down gasping if he'd been a human being. The girl's name is Isabel. She just kind of shrugs off the blue haired boy and is like, he's all yours, boys. Enter knife boy. Now we're back in Clary's point of view and she walks into the back room. She is 15 years old at a nightclub. She can't dance and she's following boys with knives into back rooms alone. Clary, baby. Okay, so anyway, she walks in and the room is empty. And she's sort of like, oh man, like what was in that fruit punch? And starts to turn around when she hears laughter and she kind of blinks and all of a sudden the room is filled with people, okay? Our little posse that we just saw. Blue haired boy is now tied to a pole and knife boy is in the middle of interrogating him. He's like, are there more of you? Where did you come from? Blah, 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 blah. And Clary's first thought is, oh my goodness, I have become involved in a gang war in an all ages club called Pandemonium. <laughs> but she quickly realizes it's not a gang, it's just a bunch of crazy people because Knife Boy starts talking about demons and Clary's like, oh, 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 okay, this is too crazy for me and she starts to back away. But then Blue Boy, who is like struggling, not cooperating, acting really weird, the dark haired boy is just like, Jace, this is annoying, just kill it, let's move on. Knife Boy, who we now know of as Jace, raises his knife He's about to stab blue haired boy and Clary is just like, hey, you can't kill him. Bless her heart, bless her heart. Everybody whirls around and dark haired boy is the first one to speak. He's literally just like, what is that? <laughs> and that's Alex's whole personality, by the way, just so you know. It's a girl, Jace said, recovering his composure. Surely you've seen one of those before, Alec. Your sister Isabel is one. This is Jace. Resand may have invented feminism, Jace invented sarcasm and narcissism, and we love him for it. He takes a step closer to Clary, squinting as if he couldn't quite believe what he was seeing. A Mundy girl, he said to himself, and she can see us. So I completely forgot that this was a thing. So because this world, all of these different series takes place in different places. So this is in New York, but a lot of them take place in London. Some take place in LA. And like I said, they're in different eras. So this is supposed to be like early 2000s New York City, right? So the slang changes depending on where you are. So I completely forgot that they use the term Mundy to refer to like normal people instead of mundane, um, but that's a thing that's gonna be going throughout the book and I hate it. <laughs> but yeah, Clary, Clary the Mundy girl. Mm -hmm. Clary is basically like, hey guys, you aren't supposed to kill people. And Jace is like, yeah, keyword, people. And he points to the blue haired guy. He's like, not a people. <laughs> At this point, blue haired boy rips out of his restraints, lunges at Jace, and now there's this huge scuffle going on. He's sitting on Jace's chest. Suddenly, blue haired boy has talons and he just starts like ripping into Jace. Great job, Clary. Good job with the distraction. Isabel suddenly has a whip. We love her. She just pulls weapons out of everywhere. Somehow whips blue haired boy and like ties up his hands again. So Jace is able to sit up and plunge that knife into blue haired boy's chest and a blackish liquid exploded around the hilt. Blue haired boy's eyes flicker. He says something in what I assume to be a demon voice. Like, you know, when there's seven voices all talking at the same time and it's like, blah, blah. yeah, that's what he does. And then he just goes poof. 
Clary, understandably, is like, what the fuck? And starts to run. Isabel is screaming at her because she almost got Jace killed. Clary is like, the police are coming. I called the police, even though she totally didn't call the police. And Jace is sort of like, okay, good luck, girl. Like, what body? The demon went poof. Like, even his blood thing is gone. So he's like, what are the police gonna do, girl? And Jace randomly is like, by the way, they just go back to their dimensions. Like, I didn't really kill it. Like, I sh Dark haired boy, who now we know is named Alec, who in the movie is played by the same guy who was in Airbud, and that's all I can think of. I like to think in another world, if Jace and Alec weren't shadow hunters, Airbud would have just been about Alec and Jace's friendship and Alec teaching Jace to play basketball. Fanfic, write it, somebody. Alec is basically like, Jace, you gotta stop just saying shit. Like, she's not supposed to even see us. She's not supposed to know any of this. She's a Mundy. Jace is like, I don't know if you've noticed, Alec, but like, she can see us. The jig's up. Like, she's already got us, right? And Jace is basically like, let's just let her go. Let her run away. She'll probably forget about this when Simon busts in. He has this big bouncer with him. He's like, where is he? Where's the guy with the knife, Clary? And of course to them, Clary's just standing alone in an empty back room. And so Clary just kind of looks around and is like, my bad, time to go home. Welcome to the book. In this series in particular, Cassandra Clare just kind of throws us into it. Like we start immediately. So welcome to the show. <laughs> Back home, we learn some things about Clary's life. So first of all, she lives alone with her mother, Jocelyn. Her father, who was named Jonathan Clark, was in the military and died when she was really, really little. Like she has no memories of him. All that she really has is her mom has this box that has his initials JC on it. And inside are like his military medals and like a lock of blonde hair. That's it. Jocelyn is an incredible artist. That is her full-time job. Clary is also very artistic. She's always drawing, but we get the feeling that she feels like she's never gonna quite be on the same level as her mom, okay? And now remember, this is the day after the whole club fiasco, and a new character that we are introduced to, Luke, who is her mother Jocelyn's boyfriend, who seems like a nice guy. He seems like very 90s sitcom dad, you know, just like this harmless guy. And so Clary is sort of like, hey Luke, you know, would I be crazy if I saw something that nobody else could see? And Luke is just sort of like, aw kid, you're not crazy, you're just different or something like that. Some like stupid bumbling, guy talking to a teenager pep talk, right? We love Luke, but mm, get it together, man. He's over at the apartment to help Jocelyn pack. And Clary looks around at the boxes and she's like, why are we packing? Her mom is suddenly like, ooh, surprise. Uh, I've decided we're taking a family vacation because Luke has some cabin in upstate New York or something. And she's like, we're all gonna go there for the summer. And Clary is like, no, we aren't. She's like, I would like to spend the summer in New York with my friends. She apparently is taking classes at Tisch, which is very expensive. She's like, what about these art classes that I'm supposed to take? And Jocelyn is basically like, Mm, well, you don't really get a say in it, honey, so you're coming. This starts off a classic teenage daughter and mother fight. Luke is like standing in the corner partially just to like get out of it, but he looks really moody and like extra mad about this whole situation, which like Luke seems like, again, the kind of golden retriever, happy-go-lucky kind of guy. So him being like really grumpy about his girlfriend and her daughter fighting, pay attention to that, right? He all of a sudden is just like, ugh, uh, I'm leaving. I gotta get out of here. And Jocelyn follows him into the hallway. This is where we do a little eavesdropping and we get some juicy bits of information. Apparently, they're looking for someone who's missing. Clary thinks she hears them say something about Tanzania, but whoever this person is that Jocelyn seems to be looking for, Luke is like, you can't keep going to him forever, Jocelyn. Hmm? And then she says like, but Clary and Luke is like, she isn't Jonathan, okay? Clary isn't Jonathan. So you gotta let it go, 
Jocelyn. None of this makes sense to us, by the way. The rest of the conversation makes it seem like Jocelyn just really wants to get Clary out of the city. And for some reason, Luke is just like, you gotta talk, you can't just keep running. You gotta talk to her, all right? She's almost an adult. She's all 15 years old. And so again, he's like, I'm just, I gotta get out of here. I gotta go. So he starts to leave when the door swings open and Jocelyn screams and is like, Jesus. And Simon says, nope. Just me. Somebody call now. Simon is here to pick up Clary so that they can go to one of their friends poetry readings at a local cafe. Clary basically just runs out of the house without even talking to Jocelyn because Jocelyn of course is like, you get back here, we need to talk. And Clary's just like, absolutely not. We're in her head and she's like, I just can't talk to her right now. I'll talk to her tomorrow. I'll talk to her later. And we know in a book in the early 2000s when a character is like, I'm gonna talk to them about it later, Mm hmm okay. Anyway, they head to the coffee shop. Simon asks for her order and Clary says, I would like black coffee, black like my soul. This is, this book is such a freaking time capsule because that humor in the early 2000s, you would go to Hot Topic and you could get one of those stickers with the weird evil bunny on it and it would say something like that, you know? Truly incredible piece of literature right there. As Clary is sitting down and Simon heads to the bar to order, this girl just like slides up to Clary and is like, hey, is that your boyfriend? Because if he isn't, He's really cute. <laughs> Does that happen in real life? And Clary has this moment, this split second moment of clarity where she looks at Simon through the lens of like, could he be cute? And she's kind of like, yeah because it's Robert Sheehan. Of course he's cute. But she does the good wingman thing and she's sort of like, oh, you know, no, we're just friends. And then when he comes back with their drinks, she's like, by the way, that girl over there totally thinks you're cute. Ah, uh, this whole, there's so much cringe in this book. Clary is like, you should go talk to her. To which Simon says, that wouldn't be fair to her because they already like someone else. And of course, right when he's about to say who, he's like, Clary, you know, I should really tell you because she doesn't pay attention to a single fucking thing Simon says. Clary turns around and sees sitting next to her on the green couch, none other than Jace with a shit eating grin. Simon is like, hey, you don't look so good. Like apparently she just goes super pale. Clary's like, yeah, okay, whatever, Simon, I'm gonna be right back and gets up and follows Jace out of the cafe. <sighs> poor Simon, poor Simon. They are in the back alley behind the cafe. And this is where we learn what a Mundy actually is. Jace, of course, is like, hey, Mundy girl, or something like that. And Clary is like, you gotta stop using vocab I don't understand. World build, go. A Mundy is a mundane, which is someone from the human world without any powers. So Jace is like, so basically, a you. And Clary is like, and also you? And Jay says, mm, close, but no, try again. <laughs> Without explaining any further, he's just like, listen, just show me your right hand and I'll leave you alone. So Clary does, and he looks at her hand and he's like, mm, okay, are you left-handed? Show me your left hand. <laughs> and she is like, no, just can you tell me what's going on? To which he kind of does. He starts bubbling off words again that we don't know. He's like, shadow hunter children usually get the voyance rune when they're very little. It's the permanent rune that helps you see the magic world. And Clary is just like, As if that wasn't weird enough, Jace is like, okay, okay, okay. Last favor, just relax your mind for a second. Could you do that for me? He's like, wait for it to come to you. And then he says these weird words and Clary all of a sudden gets this kind of shimmer of a glimpse of the tattoos on his skin, which are invisible. And he's like, great, I knew you could do it. Come with me. Can you imagine this like actually happening to you? Like, no, Clary, don't follow him. You've already followed him into enough dangerous situations. And Clary, to her credit, is like, no, thank you. You are an invisible man with occasionally invisible tattoos and you're giving me no information. Talk to me first. <laughs> he's like, the fact that you can see me is dangerous and I'll explain later, but like I need to get you somewhere safe where you can talk to my tutor and figure out what the hell is wrong with you. Just come on, I'll, we'll talk on the way, you know? Clary is like, no, good girl. She's like, no, some answers now, please. And so answers we get. 
This is a huge chunk of world building. I'm gonna try and sum it up real quick. Here we go. In this world, we have got shadow hunters. What are they? They are half human, half angel. Yes, this was the era of the fallen angel. YA fantasy bubble was a great time. So they are descended from angels and they were put on earth to fight demons, okay? We also have downworlders, which are every other kind of mystical being. So there's warlocks, there's fae, vampires, werewolves, and Clary is like, okay, and like mummies too, to which Jace is like, don't be ridiculous. Nobody believes in mummies. The sass on this boy. Clary is like, clearly this man is nuts. Um, so bye, I'm not gonna go with you. To which he politely tells her that he will just kidnap her if necessary. But then her phone rings and it's her mom. To which Jace is like, you should get that. It's rude to not answer when your mom calls, which we love, all right? Annoying as hell, but a bonus point, all right? Nice to moms. Good job, Jace. She basically flips open her phone and is like, yeah, mom, I promise I'll be home later. We'll talk then. And her mom is like, no, no, don't come home. And then there's some noise in the background, like things are shattering. Her mom just says, call Luke and tell him he's found me. Mm -hmm. Her words were drowned out by a heavy crash and splintering wood. Who's found you, said Clary. Her frantic question was cut off by a noise Clary would never forget. A harsh slithering sound followed by a thump. Clary heard her mother draw in a sharp breath before speaking, her voice eerily calm. I love you, Clary. And the phone went dead. What the fuck? What? <laughs> Clary is so freaked out by this that she drops her phone or it's dead or something. Basically her phone has gone kaput. So she grabs Jace's phone and he's like, it's not a phone and she's running off. And he's like, and I could help you if you talked to me at all. But we know that Clary's MO is that she doesn't listen to boys when they speak to her, not Simon, not Jace. So she runs off into the distance to the one place she was told not to go home. When Clary gets home, who is waiting for her but her downstairs neighbor, Madame Dorothea. And she comes out into the hallway and is just like, your mom is making so much noise and blah, 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 like typical first floor neighbor complaints. And Clary is just like, respectfully, shut the hell up and runs up to check on her mom. So that's Madame Dorothea. She will be in this story. Um, but she's the grumpy neighbor. <laughs> the house, as we could have guessed from the sounds in the background of the phone call, is a mess. It is torn apart, but nothing is missing, like the TV, the valuables, like this doesn't look like a burglary in any way, and it's dead quiet. No one's in the house. Clary starts looking around when she hears a thump. The thump? as if that wasn't freaky enough, is followed by a dragging, slithering noise. She does a little walk through, <laughs> uh, tries to find the source of the noise, and she doesn't see anything until she looks down. It is a nasty ass, scaly creature described as something in between an alligator and a centipede. No, that's where I, the book would have ended here because I would have had a heart attack and my soul would have left my body and it would have been done. Very short book. But Clary has more guts than me. She looks at it. It's flicking its long black tongue at her, mumbling things that sounds like bones to crunch, drink the veins. Like, I don't, I wouldn't really want an alligator centipede to say anything, but I especially wouldn't want it to say those things, you know? It lunges for her after that little poetic nonsense. Clary hits it with the only thing in her hand, which is Jace's weird phone, not phone. It starts to spasm, and so she starts to run, and then she gets hit by something, and the world goes black. When she wakes up, it's to Jace's face, and he is like, girl, you are so dumb. <laughs> She apparently almost got herself killed because she got stung by a poisonous demon because of course she did. And he's like, so good job. Now I have to take you to the Institute. Remember he wanted to take her to see his tutor, right? And was like, I'll kidnap you if necessary. He's like, you fucked up. Now I gotta take you because you'll die in about 
an hour if I don't. So you're coming with me, toots. Let's go. He takes out this little silver wand looking thing and marks her arm with what we learn is a invisibility rune because she can't just be walking out of a Brooklyn apartment with like a poisonous demon bite. You know, Madame Dorothea would have questions, okay? She becomes invisible. She tries to stand, but then she just falls. And Jace caught her as if he were used to catching fainting girls, as if he did it every day. Maybe he did. When Clary comes to again, it is three days later in the Institute. She is in an infirmary. Um, she has no idea where she is. She wakes up and Isabel, our girl with the magical weapons everywhere, Isabel is standing next to her and her face looks like she's a little disappointed that Clary didn't die, but also she's intrigued. Isabel is just the chaos character. I don't know what Cassie Clare was thinking when she was writing Isabel. Everything that comes out of this girl's mouth is just madness which you will see, okay? The reason Isabel is intrigued is that apparently Clary didn't just like make the demon spasm or whatever, she killed the demon and she's technically a mundane. So that's interesting. She gets a point in Isabel's book. She's like, all right, girl made her first kill we can let her live. So when Clary opens her eyes, she's basically like, listen girl, we burned all your clothes because they were covered in blood and poison and you have no style. So um, you've got new clothes in the bathroom waiting for you. Why don't you go clean up and then you can go talk to Hodge, who is the tutor, headmaster kind of guy of the Institute. And Clary is just like, okay. <laughs> but before Clary heads to the bathroom, she's like, by the way, and this, keep in mind, is her first question upon waking up after having her mother go missing, being poisoned by a demon, knocked out for three days, and brought to a place that she doesn't know where she is and she's surrounded by strangers who are invisible and have tattoos. Her first question, um, is Jace really rude or is it like just to me? Isabel is like, oh no, no, he's like that to everyone. And I quote, <laughs> That's what makes him so damn sexy. That, and he's killed more demons than anyone else our age. Clary gives her a big what the fuck look because that is a bizarre thing to say. But Clary's like, isn't he your brother? Foreshadowing. Isabel immediately is like, ick, no. We just live together because his parents died. And Isabel, chaos remember, just starts spilling, I think, a lot of kind of personal things that maybe it's not her story to tell. She explains that his mom, Jace, Jace's mom died when he was born and then his father was murdered when he was 10 and Jace saw the whole thing. But anyway, you stink. Go clean up in the bathroom. Bye. Clary does as she's told. She gets dressed. The clothes are Isabel's. Isabel doesn't wear a lot of clothes. She puts on like the bare minimum amount of fabric. She comes out of the bathroom. Isabel has bounced and she doesn't know where she's supposed to go. This is like a giant house, school, cathedral looking thing. And she's just like, what now? She hears a noise. So she's like, I guess I should just follow that find any sign of life and she walks into a room to see Jace playing the grand piano and here we go I told you this book was cringe here we go his slender hands moving rapidly over the keys he was barefoot dressed in jeans and a gray t-shirt his hair ruffled around his head as if he'd just woken up watching the quick sure movements of his hands across the keys Clary remembered how it felt to be lifted up by those hands his arms holding her up and the stars hurtling down around her like a rain of silver tinsel Excuse me, what? Like, we didn't get any of that. She just blacked out, right? But apparently she had a moment, okay? And so this is very clearly Cassandra Clare's first traditionally published work. As I said, it gets better, but she's a little heavy-handed. 
All right, Jace is a magical, he's like the manic pixie dream girl and Clary is sort of like a himbo. After he's done being the mysterious, sexy, barefoot boy, playing the piano, we get some more information about the Institute, okay? The Institute is basically a huge building with meeting rooms and bedrooms and training rooms and everything. And it's a place that offers safety and lodging to any shadow hunter in the world who requests it. And they've got a couple of them all over the world. It's usually empty though. I guess people, not a lot of shadow hunters in New York, I don't know. But usually it is Alec Isabel, who we know are siblings, Jace is not their sibling, let's get that straight. Alec, Isabel, Max, their little brother, and their parents, they are the Lightwoods. Alec and Isabel Lightwood, okay? The parents and the little brother are apparently overseas right now. Where overseas? This is where we learn that the shadow hunters have their own damn country that's invisible to mundanes. It's called Idris, and it is located, quote, somewhere between France and Germany. So, and yeah, the mundanes can't see it, pass right through it, don't even know it exists. Clary asks Jace if he's ever been there, and Jace is like, yeah, I grew up there. His voice was neutral, but something in his tone let her know that more questions in that direction would not be welcome. But anyway, to the library. Welcome to the Institute's library. Picture the most beautiful library in the world. And you got it, okay? stunning. This is where we meet Hodge. Hodge is the tutor of the institute. He's kind of like this weird, quirky history teacher, but also like their babysitter. Odd little man, okay? He's just like a cute, quirky old guy. And bonus, he has a pet raven named Hugo, who is a part of this book. Just, that's Hugo, okay? As Clary is looking around and she sees more of the Institute, she quickly realizes that it's just the three of them, Jace, Alec, and Isabel, and then there's a bird and this old man. She's sort of like, damn, this seems really lonely and weird because like they're all the same age and she's just like, if I was living this life, I would not be super happy, you know? She ruminates on that for a sec. Hodge is like, by the way, Clary, congrats on killing that demon. And we hear a little like, <laughs> from the back of the library. Alec emerges and is like, you guys can't seriously believe that she killed this demon by herself, do you? Like, she's a 15-year-old mundane. Clary is like, um, I'm gonna be 16 on Sunday. Jace points out that that's the same age that Isabel is. You know, why are you being a little misogynist, Alec? Mm, not a good look. And Alec is like, Isabel hails from one of the greatest shadow hunter dynasties in history. And this girl, is from New Jersey. Clary is outraged. She's like, I'm from Brooklyn. I immediately hate Alec because I don't appreciate New Jersey slander, but essentially it just devolves into this shouting match in the library. They're screaming at each other and then I forget who says it, it doesn't matter, but someone's like, and anyway, that demon that you killed, it's a demon that only goes after warlocks. Like it, it specifically attacks warlocks. So like, got anything you need to tell us, Clary? Why is it attacking you? And Clary is like, I don't know. You guys just showed up at a club and I can see you guys. And ever since then, weird stuff has been happening. The only thing close to a warlock is Madame Dorothea who does tarot readings. And that's it. Like I'm not, I'm not a part of this world, guys. And Hodge is sort of like, well, if you don't know, like regardless of what's going on, I have to tell the clave, we'll get into it. I have to tell the clave about this because something really fishy is going on. Like a mundane should not be able to do this. And this is when Jace drops a truth bomb. Clary isn't a mundane. How does he know this? Because in order to get past the police and Madame Dorothea and random innocent Brooklyn people, he gave Clary the invisibility rune, remember? Runes can kill you if you aren't a shadow hunter. So Hodge is like, are you insane? And Jace is like, maybe, but it worked. He's like, go ahead, show him your arm, Clary. And sure enough, there is a fading invisibility rune 
on her arm. So now they're all trying to figure out who is the shadow hunter in her family because it's technically illegal for a shadow hunter to marry a mundane and like have children, but she's gotta be half at least if she was able to handle a rune. And this conversation leads her to be like, ooh, family, that's right. I've been missing for three days. I should call someone. <laughs> So she calls up Luke and is about to be like, you know, give him an update in case he's, I don't know, worried about his missing 15 year old almost daughter, right? And he just says, don't come to my house. I'm not your father. Don't call me for favors. I've got my own problems and hangs up. So nice boyfriend of mom vibes dashed. Okay, very unluke like very mysterious. Clary hangs up and looks really upset. So Hodge is like, all right, boys, let's leave the girl alone and kind of shuffles Alec and Jace out of the library. Clary is pretty much on the verge of tears. So he like very gently sits her down on the couch and is like, can I get you some tea? And Clary is basically like, fuck tea. I want my mom and for the world to be normal again. She also wants to kill whoever took her. All right, Clary is here. All right, this is the true Clary coming out. Blood thirsty, all right? Hodge says, unfortunately, we're all out of bitter revenge at the moment, so it's either tea or nothing. We get some kind of clunky world building where we just get information sort of thrown at us. So a weird fun fact is that Jocelyn didn't let Clary ever read fairy tales. She also mentions she doesn't get to read manga, which I feel like is a weird thing. But then Hodge is like, let's just go back to the beginning, the demon attack. Do you, did it say anything? Like usually they kind of say a name or uh, anything. And Clary is like, you know, bones to crunch, drain the veins. I think he said something about like a valentine or which is weird because even though I didn't mention it, slightly unreliable narrator you got here, my bad. Go way back to pandemonium, all right? When Jace was interrogating blue haired boy back when we thought he was a boy, he also said something about valentine. So, hmm. Hodge isn't happy with this information and he, unlike everyone else in this book, actually tells us why. Valentine, welcome to the table, Valentine. Mm -hmm. Valentine is a disgraced and dead shadow hunter. He destroyed the mortal cup and then burned himself to death along with his family, his wife and child. So, kind of cuckoo bananas. What is the mortal cup, you might ask? When shadow hunters were first created, this is the shadow hunter creation myth. The angel Raziel came down. He mixed angel blood and man's blood. And then if you drink it from this chalice, you become a shadow hunter. And then all of your children will as well. So basically like if there was a giant demon war and all of the shadow hunters died, but you still had a little bit of shadow hunter blood left, like you could make more shadow hunters. Essentially is is what the idea was behind the cup. Valentine destroyed said cup. He's on the shadow hunter's shit list for that. Now, people aren't just mad at him. He's not just a disgrace because he destroyed a cup. No, no. He was also a shadow hunter supremacist, indeed. He didn't like what is called the accords. We'll go into the government stuff in a second, but basically there is the government of the shadow hunters, which in America is called the clave. They set up something called the accords, which is a peace treaty or a list of laws having to do with the shadow hunters and then all the other downworlders. Remember what Jace told us? That's like vampires and definitely not mummies and warlocks and stuff like that. Valentine did not like those and he thought that shadow hunters were so far above the other downworlders and he basically was advocating, I think, to just kill them all. I don't know if I'm getting this mixed up with Crave, but I'm pretty sure he was like a pro-genocide kind of shit face. That's Valentine. But then Hodge suddenly is like, mmm, enough world building for this chapter. Church will see you out. Clary is like, who is Church? Church is a fat blue Persian, Persian blue cat that we love. We love Church. 
<laughs> so our good old friend Church takes Clary to Jace, and they decide to head back to Clary's house to try and find any more evidence of either shadow hunter activity or demon stuff. They're gonna be little sleuths, all right? As they're walking out of the Institute, Clary turns to Jace and is like, how did you know I had shadow hunter blood? And he was just like, seemed like the most logical explanation. I don't know. Clary is like, you guessed? Like you'd better have been pretty damn sure if you put something on my body that was going to kill me. They get in the elevator because there's an elevator in the Institute. And he was like, I was 90% sure. Yeah, I see. Clary said. There must have been like, she must have had some kind of tone in her voice. So Jace like turns to look at her. Her hand cracked across his face. He put his hand to his cheek more in surprise than in pain. And he's like, what the hell was that for? And Clary's just like, for the other 10%. <laughs> and they rode down to the street in silence. <laughs> they get all the way to Brooklyn um, before they speak again. The Institute is somewhere in Manhattan. I think it's supposed to be like St. Patrick's. Correct me if I'm wrong, but anyway, they're in Manhattan. They get to Brooklyn, not speaking. And what breaks their silence? Just a reminder that these are teenagers, okay? No offense to teenagers who are watching, but like, mm. Clary notices that Jace is getting like oogled by these other girls on the subway because they aren't invisible at this time. They can like turn their invisibility on and off. She notices these girls and then she looks at Jace and she's like, oh, damn it. Yeah, he is cute. Ugh. She actually notices that his eyes are the color of golden syrup. I, I don't know about that. And Jace is like, can I help you? Because now Clary is just like on the subway, fully turned in her seat, like. <laughs> and Clary is just like, yeah, those girls are looking at you. To which Jace says, of course they are. He said, I'm stunningly attractive. That's our Jace right there. He's like that the entire book. I'm telling you, sarcasm and narcissism, our mascot right here. Clary takes this opportunity to apologize for slapping Jace because that probably was not the best thing to do. And Jace is sort of like, hey, you know, better you slapping me than you slapping Alec. All right. And this is where we learn like, what the hell is the situation between Jace and Alec, right? We learn about something called Parabatai, which is a pair of shadow hunters that have taken a vow that kind of bonds their soul. Um, it's closer than brothers. Um, they can kind of share their power, but it also means that they share their pain. Connected at a soul level, okay? That's why Alec is like crazy protective of Jace, which we will see in this book. Anyway, they get to the house and they're looking around and they still really don't find anything. There's just nothing there that points to anything bizarre until they're about to leave and Jace gets attacked by another demon. Can't catch a break, but luckily he's able to kill it pretty quickly. This was probably like a lesser demon just kind of like hanging around. So Jace gets like a little scratch, but he's able to use a healing rune to fix himself. And as he's drawing it, and this, the healing runes fade really quickly, like every rune has a different amount of permanence. This one fades pretty quickly, like along with the scar. And Clary is looking at it as he's drawing it and she's just like, her mom had a lot of weird marks on her skin, like ghostly scars that they never really talked about. And the more she looks at Jace, the more those look like runes, the stuff on her mom's skin. So after Jace gets all patched up, he's sort of like, okay, that was weird. Let's do one more round and just check again. When the door opens and nosy Madame Dorothea pops up and she's just kind of like looking around and then all of a sudden she just starts slipping these vocabulary words that we just learned into casual conversation. She's like, blah, 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 shadow hunter, blah, 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 part of a tie. Like she just knows this shit. And so we're like, hold on, Madam Dorothea. Tell us what you know. She is not interested in helping. And even when Clary is like, they took my mother and Dorothea's just sort of like, I would give up 
girl, she's gone. Can you imagine saying that to a 15 year old? Anyway, she's not interested, but Jace kind of puts on this like official voice and is like, well, listen, ma'am, this is an official clave investigation, so I'm gonna need to take you in for questioning idiot. And Dorothea just rolls her eyes and she's like, okay, Jace Waylon, sure, I'll help you. Jace is like, how does this lady know my full name? His last name is Waylon, fun fact. So he's kind of freaked out, but Dorothea's just like, let's go downstairs and you can ask me your damn questions. Dorothea decides to make them some tea, which is, I guess, nice of her. And this is where we learn that Jace is picky a F. Cassandra Clare loves to give these random details to all of her, specifically male characters. She really loves writing her boys. So what is Jace's fun little quirk? He detests bergamot. So he doesn't like Earl Grey, which is something I can't get over. He also has mentioned he doesn't like cucumbers. Whenever Clary uses the word magic for what they do, he gets really pissy. Like he's just a very, he likes things his way and he gets really cranky about it, okay? So he's just like either being a little narcissist or a little cranky little boy the whole book and he was like the poster boy of my generation okay like the ya fantasy girlies jace was our boy and looking back i'm like we were wrong <laughs> anyway dorothea gives them their tea clary drinks hers right up because she's thirsty i guess and dorothea snatches that teacup out of her hand so quickly she's gonna do a little tea leaf reading remember she's like the psychic of Brooklyn or something. Jace also gets his tea leaves read. He goes first and Dorothea is like, there's a lot of violence in his future. He's going to fall in love with the wrong person and he has an enemy. And Jace is like, cool, just the one? It's nice. But Dorothea then turns to Clary's leaves and she's just like, I can't read these. Like, are you sure you don't have a block on your mind? Clary is like, what is, what does that mean? Like, no, I don't think so. What do you, what? And Jace is just in the corner like, hmm, makes sense, makes sense. Once again, nobody explains anything to Clary. He's just sort of like, yeah, that would explain the issues with your memory and blah, blah, blah. And Clary doesn't even ask for clarification because she's like, I'm not getting it. He tells me when he decides to tell me. <laughs> Dorothea's not done with her tricks yet. So then she pulls out her tarot deck and does a reading. She's like, pick a card, Clary. The card that she draws is this cup. It seems like the ace of cups, I would guess it is, um, but it's just like this beautifully drawn golden cup. Dorothea goes on to tell her like, oh, this is the card of love, blah, 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 blah. But what the really important thing we get out of this is that Jocelyn actually gave Dorothea that tarot deck and drew those cards herself. So Clary was like really in love with the art on the cards and it was her mother's art and without her even knowing. So this is when we realize that, first of all, Jocelyn and Dorothea never interacted. Like again, Dorothea is just this annoying downstairs neighbor, right? Um, but we learn that actually Jocelyn did know Dorothea and knew that Dorothea had a connection with the Downworlders. We don't really get like exactly what she is. She's like some kind of witch warlock something, but like she's involved in the Downworlder world so she's aware of shadow hunters and stuff like that and if jocelyn knew that dorothea knew then jocelyn all right jocelyn's keeping secrets too right basically dorothea in exchange for certain favors would keep jocelyn up to date on downworld or gossip and dorothea's like i was specifically told to keep an ear out for the name valentine and i was supposed to alert her if i ever heard anything about that. So that's the third time we're hearing about this damn disgraced dead dude. What's up? So Jace finally is like, okay, but if she knew about the Downworlders, like what was she? And Dorothea says, Jocelyn was what she was, but in her past, she'd been like you, a shadow hunter, one of the clave. <sighs> So Clary's mom is the shadow hunter. We learned that Jocelyn specifically picked this apartment because of Dorothea and Dorothea was sort of like a protector. She didn't, she didn't seem to really want the job, but like, you know, she did the job. And Jace is sort of like, Jocelyn wouldn't pick this place just because of Dorothea. Like you could find a nicer neighbor, you know? And he kind of looks around the apartment and he sees this curtain and he just rips it down. Like Jace Waylon 
rude, rips down this curtain and he's like, oh really? She didn't pick the place because of this? And it's this weird looking door, swirly, clearly magic shit going on behind this curtain, right? Turns out it's like this magical portal. Dorothea calls it a five dimensional door. Essentially, if and when Jocelyn ever needed it, she could use that as an escape route and go to safety. That's why she chose this apartment building, right? And remember, right before her mom disappeared, they were planning on quote unquote escaping the city to go to Luke's cottage in upstate New York. And Clary is like, well, why didn't she use it earlier? Like if she felt like she was in danger and clearly we're like going upstate New York, like she knew something was up, why didn't she just use it? And Dorothea's like, because she wouldn't leave you and she's not gonna tell you about this. And Clary is sort of like, well, I guess something pushed her to use it. I'm gonna go get her. And Clary just jumps through the portal girl. Luckily for Clary, the portal takes you wherever you are like most thinking of going, which she didn't know. So like, thank God she was thinking very clearly of Luke's cabin in upstate New York. Jace is smart enough to immediately jump after her and they definitely like bonk foreheads <laughs> on the way there. But anyway, they safely mm, land right in front of Luke's cabin and they decide you know we're here so we might as well look around it doesn't look like luke is there so they're gonna do a little investigating in order to do that jace hops the chain link fence as he does that this dark figure just like comes busting out of a bush jace starts chasing it clary is like climbing up the fence after him and jace you just hear him go like i got him i got him and the mysterious figure is like you can get off me now you pretentious asshole and it's simon with his glasses askew. <laughs> Clary immediately runs to Simon, picks him back up, starts fixing his hair and stuff. Jace wanders over to the porch where he astigiously pretends to ignore them while using his stele to file the edges of his fingernails. The stele or stel is the like silver pen looking thing that you use to write runes with. So he's over there cleaning his fingernails, right? Simon is like, by the way, Clary, what the fuck? Because she's been missing for now, like going on four days and hasn't even thought to contact Simon. Like his best friend just fell off the face of the earth, left him at this damn poetry reading and he hasn't heard from her since. He's like, excuse me. He also says possibly my favorite line ever um, in the movie, they put it in a different scene, but Rob's delivery is so perfect that I'm just going to let him say it. So wait, your mom is gone and you're hanging around with some dyed blonde wannabe goth weirdo? I mean, where'd you come across this guy? Oh, and for the record, my hair's naturally blonde. Anyway, he is up here in the bushes because he was looking for Clary, right? Because radio silence. And he's like, when I was up here, I saw Luke packing and he was packing weapons. So what the hell is going on, Clary? Like, you've got to tell me. And Clary kind of looks over at Jace and is like, is that allowed? Like, can I? And Jace at this point is just like, Ugh. I've sworn vows that I'm not allowed to tell anybody, but you didn't. So I'm not, I'm not gonna stop you. I'm just gonna be over here on the porch. I'm not listening. And so Clary catches Simon up and lucky for us, Simon plays D&D. &D. So he kind of absorbs it all and he's just like, okay, that tracks. Don't stop the plot on my account. Let's go, I'm in. <laughs> he's actually like a little bit excited. Um, Clary is horrified and confused and Simon's just like, oh. I've been waiting for this day, you know? <laughs> they walk into Luke's apartment and now that I'm thinking about it, I don't, I think that the portal just took them to Luke. It took him to his apartment in Brooklyn. That's what it is. I'm sorry. They didn't go all the way to upstate yet, but they're at his apartment also in Brooklyn. Anyway, they break into his apartment. He lives in kind of this half apartment, half bookstore situation. It doesn't really matter, but that's just a fun fact about him. And when they walk in, they find these chains hanging from the wall like these bloody chains which doesn't look like good news you know and then simon goes in the kitchen and he's like the coffee is still hot like i think he's here so they kind of start to hide and thank god they did because then luke walks in to the apartment followed by 
two other guys. They look like they're trying to be in disguise, but they are 100%, you know, they are also shadow hunters. And that just doesn't seem like great news. So whoever these guys are, Luke seems to know them. Um, he looks pretty like beat up and bruised, but it doesn't look like these guys did it. They're talking like kind of normally, like not friendly, but like acquaintance chatting and clary's ears perk up when he says i suppose valentine sent you to which one of the shadow hunters says yeah he thought you might have changed your mind weird this guy's supposed to be dead so uh? luke is basically like listen guys i have not changed my mind I cannot help you. Like, I would very much like to be excluded from this narrative, right? And then he says, and I don't know where the mortal cup disappeared to anyway. So just like, leave me alone, please. To which one of the shadow hunters is like, no, 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 no. Disappeared? It did not. You know that Jocelyn took it and hid it. And Jocelyn isn't awake and talking yet. So you gotta tell us where it is. And where the hell is her kid? Didn't she have a kid? What we gather is that these guys know where her mom is and they're willing to give her back to Luke if they find out where the mortal cup is. Luke continues to express how much he doesn't give a shit. He's like, I do not care about Jocelyn enough to get involved in this again. And Clary is just like this 15 year old girl. She doesn't know shit either. And she's probably dead at this point. Like we haven't heard from her in four days. Probably dead because of your stupid demon shit. I'm getting out of this country. Please leave me alone. Thank you. The shadow hunters do actually leave and Clary is obviously very shaken by this because how shitty Luke was like a good guy in her life. And that's none of that. Like hearing him shit talk, not only her, but her mom, not a good look, Luke. But we look over at Jace and he looks really pale too. And he seems really shaken by this. Why? Because we learn that those two shadow hunters were the same ones that killed his father. Once they sneak out of Luke's apartment again, Jace is like, we cannot talk about this here. We've got to go back to the Institute. Simon is like, great, how are we going to get there? And Jace is like, the L train? <laughs> Simon is basically like, damn, I just got introduced to a world of angels and demons and warlocks and they take the fucking subway. <laughs> this whole book now is Simon getting really hyped for like fantasy shit and then they just are super normal and he gets bummed. So, more, more poor Simon moments. This poor guy. <laughs> we are back at the Institute. We are greeted by Church. Jace is like, Church, take me to Alec. We've got an emergency. And instead of bringing them to Alec, Church brings them straight to Isabel, who's in the kitchen, and she rips into Jace. She takes one look at Simon, and she's like, Jesus Christ, we have another mundane in here. Like, we are going to be in so much trouble. How dare you? Blah, 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 blah. She's angry. And this girl is covered in, like, deadly weapons, right? So she's not a girl you want to get pissed off. Jace just turns to Church and is like, I told you to bring me to Alec, you backstabbing Judas. Poor Church. All right, he's just trying his best. We get some clues that Simon is suddenly quite head over heels for Isabel, does a little 180 there. She is like exactly his type, like his D&D &D fantasy dream girl. Yeah, Isabel. Clary kind of looks at Simon, looks at Isabel, realizes what's going on, and she has a brief daydream of tossing the soup that Isabel is making all over Isabel's head. So that's a development. We get the gang all together in the library where we find Hodge and we update him. And once he hears the bad shadow hunters' names, they don't matter. They're just the baddies, okay? When he hears the baddies' names, Hodge is like, oh shit, the circle is back. What is the circle? The circle is basically Valentine's little group of shit face, dark shadow hunters, okay? These are the people who wanted to wipe out all of the downworlders and return the world to, and I quote, a pure state. Doesn't sound that great. It ends up becoming a giant war. It's called the Uprising and Hodge drops a little bomb and he's like, yeah, I was in it. I was in the circle. And so was Clary's mom. Why didn't Hodge say anything earlier when they were like, hmm, I wonder who the shadow hunter in Clary's family is. Okay, weird, thanks for nothing, Hodge. But Clary is really taken aback by this. She's like, my mom was not in a shadow hunter supremacist hate group. 
okay like how dare you my mom's a nice woman and hodge is like i don't really think she had a choice there clary why because she was valentine's wife part two easy is the descent there is a moment of stunned silence and then everybody starts yelling at once turns out jocelyn and luke along with jace's father and the lightwoods were all part of the circle jocelyn luke and jace's father left once they saw that valentine was getting like a little too radical apparently it started out just as like young shadow hunters with ideas about changing the clave which if you've read more of the shadow hunter books the government is like really messed up it's understandable right these young people want to make a change in the world okay but then he went a little cuckoo and some of the crew said they wanted to leave a few like hodge and the lightwood parents didn't leave because they were very scared of valentine and what would happen if they did leave right but after the uprising most of the circle turned on valentine and actually went to the clave and gave them information and help them so they got clemency so that's why the lightwoods are free to run an institute which seems like a pretty big job for people who were like part of a shadow hunter supremacy maybe gonna start a genocide group and it's also the reason why hodge is not only the tutor for the institute but he actually has some kind of curse upon him that he can't leave the institute like he is imprisoned in the building. The reason why Valentine was so obsessed with the mortal cup is because he wanted to build an even bigger shadow hunter army. In order to become a shadow hunter via the mortal cup, you need to do a lot of extensive training because like normal humans are just not strong enough to take that transition. But Valentine was way too impatient for that. So he would just test the mortal cup on like every human he could get his hands on and 80% of them would die and he would just take the 20% and be like, look, yay, new shadow hunters. In the midst of this terrifying news, okay, Isabel walks in and she's like, gee, I hope I'm not interrupting anything. Time for dinner. Over dinner, they discuss a plan of action and Hodge is basically like, y'all are kids. You aren't even a shadow hunter. Who is this guy, by the way? So he's like, I'm going to write to the clave to get some backup. I'm going to write to Alec and Isabel's parents because they're in the shadow hunter country of Idris, apparently working on some kind of peace treaty. So we're going to call everybody back. Apparently in all of New York City, these are the only three shadow hunters right now just that just doesn't track but anyway hodge is like sit tight hopefully by tomorrow we'll have some answers so jace is like all right let's work on something we can do which is the block in clary's head but we're gonna cross that bridge in the morning because we're all so tired clary is the first one to excuse herself she's just like it's been a day it's been a big old day i'm peacing out she has this crazy nightmare and when she wakes up jace is hovering over her this happens a lot <laughs> jace just appears just looming <laughs> jace tells her like you fell asleep on the floor <laughs> didn't make it to your bed so i moved you to the guest room but somebody's here to see you and he says quote hodge sent me to wake you up actually he offered to wake you up himself but since it's 5 a.m i figured you'd be less cranky if you had something nice to look at <laughs> who is clary's visitor a silent brother what's a silent brother you're wondering why there's a monk on my wall <clears throat> the silent brothers are a type of shadow hunter and they have used the most powerful runes on their bodies it hasn't been fully described yet in the book but i'll give you a little teaser their lips are sewn shut their eyes are sewn shut they look like walking corpses they are called warriors of the mind because they basically traded their bodies in order to have these like really immense mental powers and hopefully these powers include getting in to clary's noggin all right so if you're wondering how they speak they have telepathy and they can be heard in like everyone's mind so we get introduced to brother jeremiah they're all called brother and then there there's the sister the iron sisters i don't remember if we meet them in this book but there's basically the silent brothers and the iron sisters so silent brother jeremiah arrives doesn't have much to say his lips are sewn shut so he just goes right in he's not in there very long he's like oh yeah nope not can't do it 
can't do it. There's definitely a spell on you, but like I can't handle it alone. So we need to go get some backup. Where is that backup? The City of Bones, the title of this book. She did it, guys. She did it. Jason and Clary hop in a car. They head to a cemetery and they enter through a mausoleum and just start heading down this creepy staircase. As we descend, we learn that this is actually called Silent City, not the City of Bones, but it is where the Silent Brothers live. It is like a giant underground catacomb that is connected through portals so every institute can get there really easily, everyone from interest can get there really easily, etc. The Silent Brothers get right to work. Basically, they Jeremiah brings Clary into like the area where the council meets, which is just like the top Silent Bros. They just all immediately like jump into her mind. Clary starts getting these crazy flashbacks. It's like her mom running down a street, a coffin being put into the ground, the initials JC. Then she sees a huge door and she sees two words, Magnus Bane. <gasps> she wakes up from this kind of hallucinative state and the Silent Brothers are like, okay, so if you want us to crack the curse, um, we need to kill you. So how do you wanna proceed? Spoiler, they do not let the Silent Brothers kill Clary in order to break her curse. So we're heading back to Manhattan and Jace calls Alec and is basically like, get the gang together, we've got a mystery to solve. They head to a diner and this is where we get the first hint that perhaps Alec has more than friendship feelings towards Jace. Clary can't tell if it's because of their bond or what exactly, but she's basically like either way, like regardless of what Alec's feelings are towards Jace, Jace is a really difficult person to care for. Like if he focuses on you, you feel like you're the center of the universe and the second he looks away, you're like, you feel kind of gutted. She's just like, you know, whatever's happening, she kind of starts to feel bad for Alec, even though he's been such an asshole to her. She's trying to figure out the dynamics, as we all are. But the trip to Silent City wasn't a complete fail because Jace recognized those two words that Clary remembered. Magnus Bane, what's that? More like, who's that? Magnus Bane, where are you at? I don't want to be the one to break the news, but the actor who played Magnus Bane passed away tragically young and he was great, Godfrey Gao. He will be missed and he will be remembered for his iconic role as the warlock of Brooklyn. So yes, indeed, Magnus Bane, played by the incredible Godfrey Gao, is the like grand warlock of Brooklyn. He's notorious for his parties and lucky for us, Isabel, who knows everything about everything, is like, he's got something going on tonight. Get your dancing shoes on, boys and Clary. We've got a curse to break. The party isn't until midnight, so they all kind of break off into their own groups. Um, Jace and Alec go off to like look at weapons or something. Simon and Isabel take a stroll in Central Park and Clary is just like, I need a nap. Remember, she just had her mind cracked like a little egg and she also had a nightmare. She was woken up at 5 a.m. by Jace's face. She's like going home, taking a nap. But of course, when you actually wanna take a nap, you can never fall asleep. So she lies in bed for a little bit, staring at the ceiling and she's just like, it's not happening. So she heads to the library. I didn't mention this detail, but when Hodge was telling them about the circle and Luke and Jocelyn and the Lightwoods and everybody, he was kind of like holding up a book about the circle. So she goes to the library specifically to look at that book. And as she's flipping through it, she sees pictures of her mom when she was young. Like it just looked like a group of friends. And we also get to see Valentine's face for the first time. Hodge kind of walks in and he sees Clary looking at the book and he's like, yeah, doesn't he look charming? Doesn't he look charismatic? He was just like classic cult leader material, you know? And he's also like, hey, by the way, that guy, guy standing next to Luke, not Luke, guy standing next to Luke. And he's like, by the way, that guy is Jace's dad, Michael Whalen. And Jace is sort of like, oh, they don't look alike. <laughs> but this is like the first time she's ever seen a picture of her mother young. So she's just like blown away by this. And then Hodge is like, by the way, 
Clave got back to me, they can't come help us because they think that the Institute is being watched by Valentine and because they already don't trust Hodge, because remember, he's like cursed to stay in the Institute, blah, blah, blah. He's already betrayed their trust once. They're gonna watch, but they aren't gonna interfere quite yet. So I'm gonna keep pushing for it, but just so you know, there's nothing we can do right now. And you look really, really tired. Here's a sleeping draught that I use. Like, please try and sleep. So he gives her this little potion and sends her on her way to actually take a nap. <laughs> she ends up never drinking the potion because she gets back to her room and Jace is just lounging in her bed, flipping through her sketchbook, because again, like I mentioned in the beginning, Clary draws constantly. So first of all, ew, outside clothes on the bed, invasion of privacy. Then he also starts making like weird jokes about Simon, which is just uncalled for. And he's also like, if you really want to fall asleep, I can tell you a bedtime story. She dropped the potion because she's like, ah, Jace, drops the potion, spills it everywhere. So she's like, thanks a lot. So he's like, I could tell you a bedtime story. And Clary is like, I do not care how cute this boy is. Get the fuck out of my room. <laughs> but Jace, practicing in the ways of Clary, acts like he doesn't hear her and just tells us the story anyway. So here we go. Also, spoiler, the story is true. It's about a little boy whose father gives him a pet falcon. And his father is like, train it, make it obedient. The boy ends up making this pet his pet, it's really obedient, it's really loyal, it's really caring. So he like goes to show his father, he's like, look daddy, I did it. And his father takes the bird and breaks its neck. The father says, I told you to make it obedient, but you taught it to love you. You didn't tame the bird, you broke it. The boy never forgot the day that he learned that to love is to destroy. Please remember, we are in the thick of the emo renaissance. To love is to destroy. Oh my god. And Clary, who's like trying to fall asleep, is like, that was a fucking awful story, Jace. What the hell? But she ends up actually falling asleep. But this is how we realize Jace is absolutely a self-centered narcissist, but we understand why he keeps people at an arm's length because he's like, I don't want to love, I don't want to be loved, bad all around, all right? Now we get to the party and I'm not gonna go into detail about the party because it is horribly written and very 2007 core. Basically what you need to know is that they're at a party, there's a ton of downworlders there, we've got vampires, we've got warlocks, you know, shadow hunters, not super welcome. But the main important thing that we get from entering the party, Clary realizes that Alec is gay. He is attracted to Jace. She kind of tells Isabel, like they've gotten close enough that they can like have conversations. That sounds so bad, but like they're borderline friendly, okay? So Clary says something like just kind of informally just like, ooh, you know, Alec should talk to that vampire. He's checking him out or something like that, right? And Isabel gets real serious and she is like, keep that to yourself. Apparently it's still pretty frowned upon by their parents. And she's like, even Jace, Jace doesn't know, Jace is oblivious, as we know, to anything that isn't him. Just like, please keep it on the down low. Like we, it's not the time, not the place. Don't talk about it. And Clary's like, Okay. But after they party a little bit, they finally find Magnus Bane, the host of the party, who sees the Shadow Hunters and is just like, nothing good ever comes when you guys are here. How the hell did you get in? But once Clary describes the curse and like seeing Magnus's name in her weird hallucination, Magnus is like, oh yeah, like that was definitely me because if you saw my name, that's kind of like a signature, like if an artist signs their work. He's like, yeah, I was really proud of that one. That was like a really good one that I did. And who asked him to put this on Clary? Jocelyn. As I was rereading this, I was shocked by how bad the writing is in this book, particularly the party scene. She uses when Magnus Bane like looks into her mind to figure out the specifics of his spell, right? She uses the term mind rape. 
thinking of her writing in her most recent series, The Last Hours, I cannot imagine these are the, they're written by the same author, but they are. So again, this is why I'm covering this story in spoken form because it's like worse than I remembered. <laughs> but we continue. Basically, her mom was trying to suppress any of Clary's possible shadow hunter memories. She would bring Clary to Magnus every two years and he would like renew the spell. He can't technically undo the curse, but he's like, listen, it's fading, which is why she can see the other shadow hunters and all of this stuff. It's clearly like her curse is sort of sputtering out. But in case he can help her trigger her memories, he happens to have a book of like all of the Shadowhunter runes and he's like, why don't you flip through this? And she does and nothing really happens. So he's like, just wait it out girl. And also like, can you guys get out now? Because I have not enjoyed your company whatsoever. He also is not interested in any kind of talk about the Mortal Cup because warlocks are immortal and he was around during the whole uprising like he knows her parents as kids he's been around the block a couple times and he's like been there done that don't want to hear about valentine don't want to hear about that damn cup please leave my party and as he's shuffling them out the door he turns and he gives alec a little wink and says call me you know i don't like you guys but i'll let you stay but only because of the hot one Thank thanks you. What? I meant him. The one with the blue eyes. <laughs> but before Magnus can turn and go back to his party in damn peace without these stupid shadow hunter kids around, Clary finds Isabel and is like, where's Simon? And Isabel is drunk as a skunk off of fairy wine. And she's like, oh, Simon, he got turned into a rat and he's hiding under the bar. And Clary is like, <laughs> she starts screaming. She ends up finding Rat Simon. She's screaming for Magnus, like, fix it. Can you undo this? Blah, blah, blah. Apparently, like, undoing spells is just not Magnus's forte. And he's like, he just drank a funny cocktail. Put him in your backpack. Try not to shake him too much. And he'll be fine. He'll wake up with some weird stories to tell but he's gonna be okay. So Clary does as she's told, grabs Rat Simon, throws him in her backpack, and they start to head out. Right before she leaves though, Magnus grabs her arm and he's like, listen, when your mom asked me to put that spell on you, she wasn't trying to protect you from other downworlders like werewolves or fae. She was trying to hide you and protect you from other shadow hunters. So like, keep that in mind with like the company that you keep. Oh. They are walking home and Clary decides to take Rat Simon out of her backpack. I don't know why she couldn't have just like held him. Like people walk around New York City with weird things in their hands all the time. A girl holding a rat isn't that strange. So she opens her bag and Rat Simon is gone. They retrace their steps and I don't really... I. I don't really, can't really understand how this happened. They retrace their steps and they realize that while they were talking, sometime between putting Rat Simon in her bag and fully exiting the apartment where there was the party, vampires took him. She got like pickpocketed. Her rat best friend got pickpocketed out of her backpack, kidnapped by vampires, and now they have to go get him because once he eventually turns human again, they're going to suck his blood and kill him. So. That's our next adventure. This is why this book series is just ludicrously long, okay? We have these random side adventures of rescuing Rat Simon. It's not the last time we have to go on these weird side quests, okay? Let's go get them. The scene that takes place in the vampire lair where we go to collect Simon is so long and drawn out that I'm not gonna go through it all, but basically the vampires live in this hotel that's called like the Hotel de Muerte or something, like very My Chemical Romance, like I said, 2007 core. So they break into this little My Chemical Romance fan meeting and they find where they are keeping Rat Simon. There is this huge fight scene. They are so greatly outnumbered until a bunch of werewolves just pop out of nowhere. They like break through the windows and they start helping the shadow hunters. And this is really weird because 
we get like bits and pieces of what the rules of this world are but according to those accords that we talked about that valentine really doesn't like the kind of peace treaty and the rules of downworlders vampires and werewolves are not supposed to be around each other they kind of have this like dual restraining order like they just for whatever reason are not allowed to be around each other so the wolves are breaking the law by jumping in and helping shadow hunters who again shadow hunters and downworlders Worlders don't really get along. So this is all together very strange, okay? The vampires remind the wolves that they're not supposed to be here. They're like, please get out. This is not your battle. And the wolves are like, we're just here for the human girl. We'll leave the second we leave with the human girl, okay? While the vampires and the wolves are distracted, Rat Simon bites the vampire that he is being held by gives him a taste of his own medicine and the vampire drops him and he like scurries off and shows them the door to the exit. This is me. I think it's apparent that I need to rethink my life a little bit. As the shadow hunters are running to the exit following Rat Simon, one of the wolves lunges at Clary and she has this brief moment of like warrior clarity where she grabs a dagger off of Jace and throws it at the wolf's face and somehow manages to escape. Okay, so shadow hunters running out of the Hotel de Muerte or whatever. They split up, Alec and Isabel head out one way, Clary and Jace head out in the other, and Jace finds a vampire motorcycle because, fun fact, all vampires ride motorcycles. They hop onto one, Jace is driving, Clary's in the back, and they just gun it off of the roof. When I was reading this, I was like, wait, am I reading this correctly? Yes, vampire motorcycles can fly. <laughs> Once again, Clary is like, hey Jace, how did you know that this vampire motorcycle was gonna fly instead of maybe it being a regular motorcycle that doesn't fly? And Jace was sort of like, I just had a feeling, I guessed. Jace is insane. He just like does shit and it happens to work out for him because he's God's favorite. But like, <sighs> something that Jace like didn't quite remember about these bikes is that they only work during the night. So they're flying around New York. He's got to be taking detours. Like there's no way that they are taking this much time to fly around the city just to get back to the Institute. He's definitely like joyriding. And the sun rises and they fall painfully to the ground. Rat Simon also happens to turn into human Simon great timing. And Clary and Simon have this really great reunion. He's like, I can't believe you guys came back for me. I thought I was a goner, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden he blinks away as if the brightness of the rising sun hurt his eyes. More on that later. For some reason, Clary is not affected by the fall from the flying motorcycle, so Jace and Simon end up in the infirmary. When she goes to check on them, Jace attempts a joke. I think that his humor was also injured in the fall because he says something along the lines of, do you remember you promised if we lived through the vampire fiasco, you would give me a sponge bath? And Clary is like, ooh, I think you're misremembering because I'm pretty sure I said, Simon would give you the sponge bath. Jace looked involuntarily over to Simon, who smiled at him widely. As soon as I'm back on my feet, handsome. I love Simon so much. Simon is my favorite character. Simon is the reason that I continue reading the series. Love Simon. She leaves her two favorite boys in the infirmary, goes for a little bit of a walk around the Institute, where we run headfirst into Alec, who even though, remember, we have a little bit of pity for him because he may or may not be pining after Jace and has to be closeted, he's still an asshole. Humans contain multitudes. Alec is basically like, you need to get the fuck out. Ever since you arrived, Jace has been put in these like near-death experiences multiple times. I can't have you around. He's freaking out. They get into a screaming match when Clary drops this little nugget of knowledge that Alec has never killed a demon, which is weird because that's his reason to live. Shadow hunters were created in order to kill demons. He's never killed one, which is bizarre. And Jace told Clary that kind of in confidence and Alec is shocked. He was like, Jace would never tell you that. 
there's no way that he would trust anyone enough to tell them my biggest secret or the biggest secret that Jace knows, right? She also is like, this tantrum is just because you're in love with him. And when she says that, he slams her into the wall. Apparently the pain in her arms is so intense that she gasps. And then he like kind of blinks and almost like he's coming out of a trance. Like he didn't realize that he was hurting her and he just like storms off. So like that whole interaction is very weird. We only get these like glimpses of Alec and he is just this enigma, seems like a really angry guy, troubled Alec Lightwood. <laughs> We get some cute friendship bonding time with Simon and Clary. He has been moved out of the infirmary, but he's just kind of like hanging out in her bed. They're talking, having a good time. I love their friendship. And he kind of falls asleep when there is a knock on the door. It's Jace and he's like, listen, Clary, I just remembered that it's your birthday. Cause remember when Alec was like, she's a 15 year old from New Jersey. And she's like, I'm gonna be 16 on Sunday and I'm from Brooklyn, it's Sunday apparently. So Jace is like, Isabel and Alec are picking fights with me. I don't want to be around them. And it's your birthday, so why don't we have a little picnic in the greenhouse and celebrate? Apparently, Jace is really good at setting up picnics. It's like apples and chocolate cake and cheese sandwiches that are really, really good. I don't know. This is like one of his weird quirks is that he makes an excellent picnic spread, which is a really good talent, I have to say. We learn during the picnic that Growing up, Jace only really had his dad. He like genuinely did not have any friends his age until he was 10 years old. And that is the first time he had ever met another 10 year old. Um, and that was Alec. First friend, best friend, parabatai, soulmate, brother. But even with that bond, Jace is just like a lonely person in general. Um, and he really misses his father and they kind of talk about their upbringing and like he didn't know his mom, Clary didn't know her dad, everything like that. They have like an actual heart to heart that doesn't have any teasing in it, which is a first. And we are at like 50% through this book. Then midnight strikes. And remember, they're in the greenhouse. There's a greenhouse on the roof of the Institute, right? All of the flowers start to glow. There's like magical flowers in this greenhouse. And as a birthday present, Jace gives her her very own witch light, which is just like a glowing rock. And all shadow hunters have one. It's like a little flashlight that isn't a flashlight. So it's cool that she gets that gift. She and most other people still see her as like just a human, mundane, whatever. Jace is the only one that's like really hammering this home. Like, Clary, you are a shadow hunter. He's like, get that through your skull. That skull with the mind block, right? He uses her full name. I can't do this. He uses her full name to say happy birthday and his voice is apparently a little rough. They're standing very close to each other and quote, the tension between them seemed to press down on her like humid air. So what happens next? She asks, we gotta have confirmation, all right, if he and Isabel had ever dated and he's like, no, ew, she's like my sister. Foreshadowing. Clary is like, well, I don't get why she hates me so much, which is weird because like the Isabel hate train has really like slowed down. It's Alec who slammed her into a wall, right? So you're wondering why she's bringing up Isabel at a moment like this. Jace is like, you know, she's just not used to other girls being around, like leave it to a 16 year old boy to explain why teenage girls act like teenage girls, like, so anyway, he's like, you know, you're the first girl who's like been around us for a while. And Clary is like, she shouldn't be nervous. She's beautiful, which Clary walked right into that one. Jace is like, and so are you. My toes are curling guys and like not in a good way. Now they are both unable to look at each other. They have like climbed this staircase in the greenhouse to like get a better view of the glowing flowers, right? So they're walking down the stairs, not looking at each other. Clary almost steps on the knife that Jace was using to cut apples at the picnic because they picnicked on the stairs. And when she tries to swerve out of the way to not step on the knife, she bumps into Jace. He puts his hand out to sturdy her. And just as she turns to apologize, She's somehow in the circle of his arms and he was kissing her. This is a scene 
that I physically cannot watch in the movie. It is so bad. There is this weird Demi Lovato song that plays. Physically incapable of watching it, reading it is also difficult. When someone walks into your heart, your life So at first, Jace like kind of breaks off and he looks like, what the fuck just happened? But then they're like, nope, that just happened. And they get into it. We get a classic Cassandra Clare kiss scene and then Jace kind of breaks off again. And he's like, don't panic, but we have an audience. <laughs> Hodge's bird, Hugo, is in the greenhouse as well. And Jace is like, listen, if Hugo's here, it means that Hodge is coming, so like, why don't we get out of here? What do you say? Jace walks her to her bedroom door, and he's like, are you going to sleep? And Clary like kind of doesn't get the hint. Like this is just, I can't explain to you how horrible this is to read and to watch. She says something like, are you tired? And he says, and I quote, I've never been more awake. He leans down to kiss her again when Simon opens the door because remember when they left for the picnic, they had just been having their little like friendly cuddle sesh and he had fallen asleep in her bed. Do you remember this? Okay. Cue the best scene in cinema. Like I said, this is painful, painful, painful to watch, but it's all worth it for this interaction. So I'm just gonna show you the scene. Next time, it might be a nice idea to mention that you already have a man in your bed so we can avoid such uncomfortable situations. You invited him to bed? I know, it's ridiculous, isn't it? We would never have all fit. I didn't invite him into bed. We were just kissing. How swiftly you dismiss our love. Jason. How swiftly you dismiss our love? Truly the best thing that's ever been written ever and we should have just stopped writing books after that. Yeah, there's that whole debacle. Jace storms off. Simon is like, I was just here to get my stuff anyway because clearly I'm like not wanted here. I'm just this stupid mundane boy and I'm getting in the way of your romance. So off I go. I'm leaving the institute. They get into this whole shouting match when Simon finally is like, Clary, I've had a crush on you for years years and he's like so it's not that i just don't like jace and you together like because he's a dick i'm also just really sad about this development so please let me go and exit stage left simon our girl clary has a little bit of a mental breakdown because of this because she just screwed up this whole thing screwed up this whole thing Apparently, Isabel doesn't like her. Alec threw her against a wall. Hodge is just a weird dude. Hugo is this creepy bird. Where is church? We need more church content, all right? Her mom is missing. Like, everything is fucked. So she kind of just lays in her bed and she is an artiste. So when the world is crashing down, she decides to draw in her sketchbook, just aimlessly doodling. And as she's doing that, she like kind of falls asleep or something and she finds that her hand sinks into the paper and she's able to grab the doodle that she just sketched. And she's like, what? the fuck? And she has a little epiphany. She runs to Jace because he's literally the only person who like won't hurt her, I think. Um, so even though they like literally an hour ago just had this like awkward kiss and then break up, she dismissed his love? I don't know. She runs to him. He opens the door. He's in his pajamas. He's like, I do not have time for whatever this is right now, please. Can I just have a night's sleep? When Clary is like, I know how to get my mom. I know where the mortal cup is. Jay starts listening. Remember Madame Dorothea? Remember her tarot cards? Who gave her those tarot cards? And what was the card that Clary chose? Ace of Cups. Remember that beautiful cup? Clary, through her weird, like, I can grab things out of paper epiphany, is like those bad shadow hunters. Remember when they were talking to Luke and Luke was like, the cup disappeared and the bad shadow hunters were like, no, Jocelyn hid it. Clary is like, bingo. Jocelyn hid the mortal cup in Madame Dorothea's tarot card, right? And Jace looks at Clary's sketchbook and the stuff that Clary had been doodling were runes, the runes that they draw on their skin, right? To get power. And Jace is like, 
how do you know all of those? Like you just, that's a lot of runes and like we study those for a long time before we're able to draw those. So like what's, what's up with that? Clary is like, well, Magnus showed me that book of runes, but other than that, I've, I haven't, I've never been exposed to them other than you putting that invisibility rune on me and hoping it didn't kill me. So Jace is sort of like, that's super weird, but maybe it's a sign of your memory coming back. Let's put a pin in that and return to it later. Just remember, gang, Clary and her relationship with runes is pretty weird and it's gonna get weirder, okay? So this is our first taste of it. Simon's exit from our story is very short-lived because he's the only person in New York City that they know with a car. <laughs> so they call him up. <laughs> he picks them up in a van and drives them to Clary's old house. Their friendship, I mean, like I said, they've been friends for forever. Regardless of Simon's feelings towards Clary, Simon's a really good guy. I'm sorry, my bias is totally showing. Simon's a really good guy and he's basically just like, let's be friends, like I can do this. I can just be your friend. I'm really sorry, Clary. They make up. Friendship seems to be back again. This has all occurred in like a couple hours time. So we're back in the van. Simon drops them off. Clary and Jace jump out of the car, knock on Dorothea's door. She opens the door and they just storm in, find her tarot cards and Clary just goes whoop. And there's the cup. Jace is like, huh, thought it'd be bigger. But they're, they, they did it. They did it. So easy. Oh my, how is there more to this book? Then Dorothea, because we can't go to Clary's cursed apartment building without this happening, Dorothea turns into a demon. She was either possessed or like this demon is pretending to be Dorothea, whatever the case is. Dorothea, she is not. She becomes a demon, attacks Alec who is there, he like crumples to the floor. They're fighting for their lives and losing when all of a sudden Simon, hero of the story, kicks down the door to Dorothea's house because he was waiting, he was parking the van, so he arrived late and was just kind of like standing in the hallway after they had already gone in. He breaks down the door, turns out he has a bow and arrow from that one time that he did archery at summer camp. He uses the bow and arrow to make some kind of hole in the skylight in Dorothea's house. It's so vague. Anyway, he somehow like busts open a window with his arrow and the sunlight hits Dorothea and she like crumples up like a piece of burnt paper and goes poof. So Simon the Mundane has killed a demon and Alec hasn't. There's a story here. It seems like everybody else has got a hit. Why not him? We have a victory dance for all of two seconds for Simon because that was pretty badass. We gotta give him credit. But then we realize Alec is still on the floor and he got, he didn't just get like hit, he got cut and there is some of that demon juice in his wound. Even a healing rune drawn by Jace, who they're Parabatai, so like the runes that he draws on him are even stronger than normal runes. Even Jace's healing rune isn't helping him. So Simon drives like fast and furious to the infirmary. Basically all Hodge can do is just like sedate Alec and hope that he heals himself which doesn't sound too good. While they're waiting and hoping that Alec wakes up, Hodge kind of turns, they like catch Hodge up on what went down. And Hodge is like, it's a bummer that you guys didn't find the mortal cup. You went through all that and didn't find it. And Clary is like, oh, we did. And she's all proud showing him the cup. And Hodge freaks out. He's totes excited. And then he says something really fucking weird. He turns to Jace and is like, grabs him by the face and he's just like, you look so much like him, he's gonna be so proud. And Jace is like, uh, like who, Hodge? And he's like, just like your dad. And remember when we saw photos of young Michael Whalen, Clary specifically was like, he doesn't look anything like his dad. Then Hodge turns, says something in a strange language to Hugo, and Hugo just starts attacking Clary? That distracts Clary enough, obviously, an evil crow attacking you. So Clary is distracted just enough that Hodge can like reach over, just grabs the cup from her hand. Jace is suddenly unconscious. We don't know why, he just drops to the ground. Hodge just like does this weird little thing with his ring. This happens in 
in seconds. The vampire rat Simon thing takes place over multiple pages. This happens in like a paragraph, okay? Hodge grabs the cup. Jace is unconscious. Hodge does this weird little magic maneuver with his ring. A portal opens and out walks valentine hodge is sort of like yeah sorry guys i didn't call the clave for backup i lied i'm evil ha 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 it's very clear that valentine and him made some kind of bargain because the second valentine appears hodge is like hey so how about that deal we got all right i did my part and he also says like you promised not to hurt the children like you're gonna break my curse and you're not gonna hurt the children and valentine is like did you hear me agree to any of that? And like, I'm the evil one in this story. Do you think I'd agree? He's like, that's really cute of you, but like, thanks for the cup. <laughs> Valentine then just completely ignores Hodge, completely ignores Clary, doesn't even look at her. He just looks down at Jace, who is still unconscious on the floor. He says something cryptic like, he'll be with his father soon or something like that. Picks up Jace, picks up the cup, and just walks back through the portal and is gone. what what clary is held behind some kind of invisible barrier because obviously she tries to go after them through the portal she cannot clary is convinced that valentine is about to kill jace because jace's father is dead and he's like he'll be with his father soon so right she's screaming at hodge like you've got to go get him valentine's gonna kill him blah 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 hodge is basically just like you don't know shit and leaves seriously what it this book is bananas don't lose out all hope though because clary when they were at madame dorothea's in the horrible scramble while Al jace was trying to save alec with the healing rune she picked up his stele which is what you use to write runes and she has this weird epiphany again where she knows what runes she needs to write like without even studying it it just comes to her so she like writes all these runes in the air and on her skin and is able to break through whatever invisible barrier valentine had set up she of course runs after hodge apparently valentine isn't a total piece of shit because he did actually break hodge's curse so hodge can leave the institute so the first thing he does he like runs out into the street is like freedom you know clary chases after him continues to call him a piece of shit which he is when all of a sudden as if this wasn't chaotic enough i'm trying my best here guys to make this an easier story to understand but the way that it's written it's literally this chaotic i'm i apologize she steps out into the street after hodge when a bunch of werewolves descend on them one of them bites hodge's shoulder and kind of like throws him around and another one grabs clary like by the ankle or the leg or something and starts dragging her away she hits her head so hard she's unconscious it fades to black now we've been abducted by wolves. Jace abducted by a creepy person who may or may not be trying to kill him right now through some magical portal where we don't know where he is and Clary being dragged off unconscious by a bunch of wolves. And Alec is also, while this is all happening, dying in the infirmary because of a demon bite. <sighs> When Clary finally wakes up, she looks around and she assumes she's in like a jail cell because she's definitely in like a holding pen. And who is there? Luke. Yes, Luke is a werewolf and a shadow hunter. More on that later. He's been with the wolves the whole time. He gives her a little update. They didn't kill Hodge. Hodge managed to get away. They don't have his body. Never a good thing, okay? And he's also like, hi, we were the ones who saved you from the vampires so like chill out we're not here to hurt you because remember the last thing we heard luke say was basically like fuck you and your mom i don't want to be a part of this i don't care i'm leaving the country so he's like let me let me explain give me a moment luke says the only way i can get you to trust me is to tell you the whole story so here is the whole goddamn story part three the descent beckons here is the whole damn story 
from Luke's point of view. Growing up in Idris and the Shadow Hunter country, Jocelyn and Luke were childhood best friends. When they finally started to go to the Shadow Hunter Academy, that is where they met Valentine, and he is like best boy. He is handsome and charming and rich and smart. Everyone loves him. Jocelyn, just like with her art, she is a natural at being a shadow hunter. She does amazing in school. Luke, however, really struggles and he doesn't go into it too much, but he's basically like, it was to the point where I I was considering becoming a mundane because you can give up your shadow hunter powers, but you are exiled, you can never come back to the community, etc. He was like, I was at that point, like I just couldn't do what was expected of me and I was having a really rough time. But then Valentine kind of started tutoring him and helping him out. According to Luke, in his words, Valentine basically saved him when he was a teenager, sort of, it almost became like worship, right? Um, this guy saved his life. Valentine is apparently obsessed with the fact that in their generation, the shadow hunter numbers are dwindling. Remember how I said it's weird that like Jace, Alec, and Isabel are the only shadow hunters in New York City? Like based on all the other books that Cassandra Clare has written, there are lots of shadow hunters. So it just seems weird that like once we enter like the 21st century, where did they all go? So that was Valentine's question. He's really obsessed with this. His main focus, what he wants to do is quote unquote, save the race of shadow hunters from extinction. These kids are 17. You know when you're 17 and you feel like you're the one who's going to like solve this massive problem? Yeah, that's what they were going to do. And it wasn't like an evil thing. It wasn't like, let's kill all the downworlders. It was like, let's figure out what's happening in our community. Okay. When they are 17, however, Valentine's dad dies and this is where Luke is sort of like looking back. This is where he kind of starts to go off the deep end, but at the time, no one really noticed. Again, it was like, we're young, we're gonna save the world, we're revolutionary, you know? So they didn't really catch on and Jocelyn just continued her descent falling in love with Valentine. They eventually get married. This bridge is crossed much later in the story, but shadow hunters throughout her series get married very early, like in their late teens, um, because it's just expected that in your line of work, you're going to die very young because you're hunting demons. So better to like get married and have a happy life while you can, you know? So they're probably like 17, 18 years old. Everything seems okay. Obviously Luke isn't with Jocelyn like as much as he used to be when they were BFFs at school. The next time he really catches up with Jocelyn, heart to heart, she is pregnant and she is scared. She tells Luke that recently Valentine has taken to going down into their house's cellar and she hears weird noises, sometimes screaming. She just does not feel safe anymore and this is where they start to realize like he's not just kind of like a guy with big dreams. He's losing it a little bit, all right? This is distressing for Luke because Luke and Valentine became Parabatai, which is what Jace and Alec are. So they're like tied at a soul level, okay? Which makes what happens to Luke even stranger. There's some kind of emergency that happens that involves werewolves and there is a fight. And when Valentine is supposed to protect Luke, remember they protect each other like there's, there's no one else on earth, right? Apparently Valentine just like drops the ball and Luke gets bitten and that's why he is a shadow hunter and a werewolf. He turns into a werewolf because Valentine fucked up, all right? Because of all of this, everything just kind of falls apart and the next time Luke really sees Jocelyn is after her baby is born and it's not Clary, it's her older brother, Jocelyn's first child. His name 
is Jonathan Christopher. And Jocelyn has now essentially become a spy in her own house because she's reporting back like all the crazy shit that Valentine's doing. She is trying to get the word out to be like, this is what he's up to. He's fucking insane. I think he's really dangerous. Someone needs to help me, but she stays again, partially thinking she can make it work because you've got to assume that she still holds love for Valentine, but also to kind of be a spy, right? So then the uprising happens. It's a huge battle during which which Jocelyn, Luke, and their allies help overthrow Valentine. But part of what happens is they come home, Jocelyn comes home and finds that her house has been burnt down with Valentine assuming to be inside. And then they also in the wreckage find the burnt bones of a child, which she can only imagine is Jonathan Christopher because they have not seen, she can't find her son. So obviously, Jocelyn is like, fuck this, I'm out. She leaves the Shadowhunter country of Idris, goes to New York, and she's like, I'm especially out not just because all of you guys failed to protect my kid, and this guy's fucking insane, but also I'm pregnant again, and there's no way that this baby is having anything to do with her father or the Shadowhunter world. So she goes off to New York and obviously everything else happens with Magnus Bain trying to get Clary to not remember anything about possible shadow hunters, etc. And they try to start a normal life. Luke stays in Idris for a while to kind of help the shadow hunter world continue after the uprising, but eventually he makes his way to New York and, you know, childhood friends to lovers confesses that he's always loved Jocelyn and they kind of are trying to have a relationship even though their past is just like so fucked up. And that's where we are. Okay, so that picture of her dad on the refrigerator, that whole story about Jonathan Clark. No, he is a fake guy that Jocelyn made up. Like just straight up was like, here, let me find a picture of a dude. That's your dad, Clary. Okay, cut to Clary having a mental breakdown because she's finding out that Valentine is her father confirmed. Daddy evil crazy man. Luke is trying to be like, well, he wasn't evil in the beginning. He was actually kind of charming. And Clary's like, no, irregardless. Also, she's finding out she has a brother and she's like, I always wanted a brother. What the fuck? <laughs> so now that we've got that whole story, we have to get back to the task at hand. Remember, Jace just got taken by Valentine to God knows where. And Clary seems to have a hint. When they were jumping through the portal, she could hear sounds. She has one word that she's really hanging on to and she thinks Simon can help. Luckily, Simon's really good at Google and so with the tiny bit of information Clary's able to give him, he finds signs that those clues point to Roosevelt Island, which is just a little bit to the east of Manhattan. It seems like the portal might have taken them to an old abandoned asylum on Roosevelt Island. And so off they go. We've got to go get Jace and the Mortal Cup, but mostly, mostly Jace. As we have already covered in this book, Cassandra Clare's fight scenes are incredibly long. So I'm going to really breeze over this, but it is a large chunk of the book. They arrive at the asylum and they find the asylum is filled with the Forsaken. What is a Forsaken? Remember how we said that Valentine was experimenting with the cup on humans and most humans aren't strong enough to handle the mortal cup so they die? So even if you do become a shadow hunter, you still might not be strong enough to carry the runes. Like remember in the very beginning, Jace was looking for the voyance rune on Clary's hand. Babies can get that rune and that's pretty much it. Like you need to work your way up. So Valentine apparently was just like drawing runes all over these like fresh shadow hunters and they lost their minds. So they're all just like rabid feral kind of zombie things. So that's what we're fighting, okay? We've got Simon, we've got Clary, the wolves have come along. Epic fight scene, all right? As they're running around searching for Jace or the Mortal Cup or anything, they actually find her mom. Her mom is unconscious on this like altar. Cause remember the bad shadow hunters said something about like Jocelyn isn't waking up yet. Jocelyn is under some kind of spell, 
asleep inside of the asylum. So at least we found her, but we cannot break her bonds. Speaking of the bad shadow hunters, they show up, start fighting Clary. Luckily, Luke is able to jump in and Clary is able to run off and she's trying to find any weapon sharp enough to break Jocelyn's bonds. So even if they can't wake her up, at least they can get her physically out of the asylum, okay? So she's just like throwing doors open everywhere until she opens one and who is sitting in the bedroom? Jace Whalen, everybody. He, of course, is like, what the fuck are you doing here? She's like, I came for you, obviously. And he basically says like, you're such an idiot. Like, why did you do that? His voice was angry, but the gaze that swept her face, the fingers that gently brushed her hair back were tender. Of course, he's like, if anything ever happened to you, I and he can't finish the sentence. You know, we're at that stage of the romance, right? They like, <laughs> But she's like, don't worry, I'm not that much of a dumbass. Like, I didn't come alone. I have Luke. The wolves are here. And at that, he kind of changes his tune. He's like, no, no, no. You, there's been a misunderstanding, okay? You need to tell Luke to call off his pack. You don't know the full story. Like, put a pause on this whole thing. That is when Clary kind of takes a look at him. And when they had been at Dorothea's house, he got beat up. Like, Alec got seriously hurt by like her demon Iker or whatever it's called but Jace also took a real beating and he when they had like come back to the infirmary to drop Alec off and like he got taken by Valentine and all of this crazy stuff happened he was covered in cuts and bruises and blood and stuff like that and this has been you know a couple hours maybe since then she takes a look at Jace and she's like you're healed like somebody took real good care of you, bud. What's going on? Jace is like, you're gonna think I'm crazy. And Clary is like, cross that bridge a long time ago, Jace, but like, I'll listen to you. Jace, not only is he like completely cleaned up, but he has like a whole new wardrobe on. Like he looks as if that fight never even happened, right? Is Jace crazy? What happened, Jace? He says, my father gave me these clothes. To which Clary says, your father is dead. You saw him get killed in front of you when you were 10. But Jace says, with a voice that felt like he was holding back some enormous feeling, like horror or delight or both. I thought he was, but he isn't. It's all been a mistake. And that's when his father walks into the room. Valentine himself. Oh yes, we've reached the point of the plot that everybody talks about. Indeed, everyone, you're not mistaken. Buckle up, buckle up. Valentine is like, hey kids, have a seat, pop a squat, we need to talk. And that's when Clary realizes that Valentine knows. Like, Valentine is also aware. Even though he totally ignored her when he grabbed Jace, he knows who she is. But Jace, remember, wasn't there for the whole Luke explanation. So he still thinks that her father is that like random picture of a soldier who died when she was teeny tiny, okay? He's not in the know, not in the know. And remember, she also just found out that she has an older brother that allegedly died in the same fire as Valentine, who clearly didn't die. So perhaps big bro didn't either. Uh-oh. Valentine isn't outright saying like, hello, daughter Clary, but like they're kind of looking at each other like they know, but for some reason he's not saying it. So Jace doesn't know and she's getting really frustrated about this. She's like, no, there's no way that Valentine is your dad, Jace. And this is hilarious because the whole book, Jace has been wearing this ring that has a W on it for Waylon because like it's the only thing he still has from his dead father. And she's like, there's no way that you can be Valentine Morgenstern's son because you have a ring that has a W on it. And Valentine just reaches over, takes the ring off of Jace's finger, flips it upside down and is like, boom, it's an M. He's always been a Morgenstern. <laughs> And then it gets even better. So the ring, if you weren't convinced by the ring, here we go. Valentine randomly starts calling Jace Jonathan. And Clary is like, okay, cool. So Valentine has brainwashed Jace because there's no way that he would like answer to the wrong name, whatever. So she's kind of like, okay, this is fine. We can 
get ourselves out of this weird predicament. And Valentine just keeps talking. He's like, blah, blah, blah. Hodge was actually at the center of this whole thing. You know, he's the one who's in the wrong. It's been a big misunderstanding. And Jace is like, yeah, so see, like, Valentine's actually trying to help us. It's all Hodge who's been the evil one. And Valentine's like, yes, Jonathan is right. And Clary finally snaps and is like, Jace, why are you letting him call you by not your name? This is, why are you suddenly Jonathan? And Jace is like, well, that is my name. Pa pardon? Yeah, Jace is a nickname because his initials are JC. Jace, JC, Jonathan, Christopher. That is when Valentine drops the bomb. Again, he's like not reading the room. He just like is happy that his evil plan is working. So he's just like, yeah, and Jocelyn's your mom, Jonathan, which means Clary is your sister. Jace goes an awful color, a sort of greenish white. So he's like all hyped up because he's like, my dad isn't dead. It's just this kind of evil guy, but he's a misunderstood evil guy. It's fine. I've just been wearing my ring upside down. It's all good, Clary. But then he gets that news and he's like, oh, oh no. <laughs> and I mean, I don't know how quickly I personally would believe anything that's going on, but she's just like, the coincidences are too weird. And she's being hit by all of these little details so quickly, like, oh, my mom's a shadow hunter. Oh, Valentine's my dad. Oh, I have a dead older brother, but now maybe n none of my relatives are dead and blah, 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 blah. And like, why wouldn't it be Jace? What are the odds? How many Jonathan Christophers are there that are his age? You know, like he has a ring that has an M on it. Could be a W, but it's an M. You know, it's a little unbelievable how quickly they all believe it. But Clary especially is just like, too many coincidences, bud. I think he's maybe telling the truth. And Valentine, just to like close some of the plot holes, he explains that Michael Whalen, Jace's alleged dad, died in the uprising and he took Michael's name. So Valentine has been living as Michael and he lived with Jace in the cottage as he was growing up until he was 10 years old. I just don't believe, like wouldn't Jace then recognize Valentine, <laughs> mm, plot holes galore. But anyway, so he decides to fake his own death and go into hiding. And that's why he sent Jace to live with the Lightwoods. And that's why he thinks that his dad, Michael, died when he was 10. Okay, and the bad shadow hunters helped stage his death. Mm, this is when Luke breaks in to that room and starts fighting with Valentine. Brother and sister pull to the side. They also stop start fighting because Jace is like shit talking Jocelyn. He's like, well, guess I had a mom all along, but she just fucking abandoned me and left with you to go live this happy life in New York. And Clary is like, she found bones. She thought you were dead. And Jace is like, I'm right here, honey like clearly not and they just like are bickering like it's just chaos all of a sudden it starts to get really really violent luke and valentine are still fighting and it seems like valentine is about to kill luke so clary just like jumps in front of valentine's knife valentine like doesn't even hesitate he just keeps going with the stab and so jace throws his dagger and hits Valentine's hand and is like, you better stop this nonsense, okay? Doesn't deter Valentine though because he still is going after Luke and this time Jace just fully steps in front of the blade. Valentine might not have given a shit about his daughter, but when Jace steps in front of his knife, he's like, oh, ho hold on, son, let's talk. Jace is like, you should leave. Okay, you need to go. And so Valentine is like, Jonathan Morgan Stern, you listen here, buddy. And Jace is like, it's not my name. And he holds his blade a few inches below his father's chin. He says, I'm Jace Whalen. Ooh. Like yes, the real Jace comes to the surface. Basically, he's like, listen here, daddy. Even if you're my father, Okay, you made me think that you were dead. You let a 10-year-old witness your death 
and then just carted me off to live with strangers and think that my mother is dead, think that my father is dead, not know that I had a sister. And he's basically just like, fuck you, dad. And then Clary is like, and he killed your grandparents. And Jace is like, and you killed my grandparents. Because apparently Luke is like, looking back, their deaths were a little suspicious, okay? They keep on fighting. Luke's second in command, who's named Alaric, shows up, tries to protect Luke as well, and he gets killed. So Luke is just distracted just enough and Valentine uses that moment to get towards the portal so that he can escape. Jace is catching Clary up. He's like, listen, Valentine told me that he took the cup to Idris and he hid it there, so I'm gonna go after him and I'm gonna save it. Clary is like, it's a fucking cup, man. Don't do it. Let the clave handle it. Let the adults bother with this piece of shit like you've got my mom you've got us you know don't don't risk it in this time where he's like should i stay or should i go valentine escapes and the portal closes behind him so jace is like well fuck i fucked this all up we lost the cup we lost valentine my parbata is dying in the fucking infirmary this was a disaster i forget how like <laughs> difficult this book is to read because like she writes emotion so well and like you can feel all different kinds of heartbreak in this scene and so yeah that's where our story ends but we get an epilogue we get an epilogue so hold on everybody quick updates from the epilogue okay clary's mom is still not waking up still a sleeping beauty okay but good news is magnus shows up like uncalled for just like knows he is needed comes to the infirmary and saves alec from his demon poisoning so alec is back from the brink thanks to magnus simon picks clary up from the hospital where she's visiting her mom because they brought her to like a mundane hospital i don't know why but so she's just like in a coma in a hospital right so simon picks clary up to take her to the institute and as he's driving her there he's like so how you so when and he's kind of talking about this whole situation and she basically says like it's fine like nothing happened between us anyway which no one believes <laughs> we get back to the institute and isabel is suddenly like a super happy bubbly girl and she's like i just thought you didn't like me that's why i was mean bad i don't know it's like silly silly girl stuff um but anyway we're frenzies with isabel now cool and alec also has had his like come to jesus moment because he almost died and he's like hey clary i realized i'm a complete asshole and i'm sorry as well so now alec and isabel are team clary cool that was easy to clear up clary finds jace in the greenhouse where nothing between them happened right right he is playing with a piece of the mirror that was part of the portal that valentine went through like he in the asylum jumped through a mirror and then shattered the mirror so that nobody could follow him and jace like took a little piece took a little piece little souvenir you know so he's looking at it and he can like vaguely guess where valentine went but like it's not it's not enough so he just kind of keeps it and obsesses with it and that's never good especially not in an epilogue right jace gives us a little heart to heart things that we could already kind of infer and that was his childhood was his happiest time before he lost his father was pretty much all of his fondest memories living in idris living in Shadowhunter land with his dad even though it was kind of lonely like it was just him and his dad and he loved it that's why he's so willing to believe valentine you know he's so desperate to go back to that time and so to clary he's sort of like you know at, at least i guess i have you now right like he misses that feeling of having a family and so he's sort of like i'm i'm at least happy that we have each other to which clary is like by the way mommy dearest is in the hospital like do you want to come visit her you haven't seen her since you were like two years old clary is like she's in a coma but apparently if you talk to people you know she might wake up if she hears your voice which kind of doesn't make sense because she's never heard his adult voice but anyway jace is like yeah not ready for that yet but i'll think about it and they start to walk out of the institute the reasoning is unclear but magnus bain decided to gift them the institute as a whole a single vampire motorcycle so this book ends with brother and sister riding off into the sunset on a flying vampire motorcycle and they remark about how nothing has changed 
But everything has changed. Look, Clary, I don't believe it. It doesn't feel like the truth, not in my heart. I, I just don't know how to look at the world anymore. Everything's different. The world's the same. You're the one who's different. So, yeah, obviously we're going to dig into this a little bit more. You can vote in the comments if you believe Valentine's story or not. Are they really related? Are they half siblings? Are they no siblings? You know, that is a huge thread of this five, six book series is figuring out what the hell what the hell cassandra clare like i said i haven't decided exactly how i'm going to be breaking up the rest of the books ironically the movie is much shorter than this so if you want to just watch the movie it's really great i have to say but yeah we will continue and it's gonna take turns you would never expect so i'm excited to continue and share this with you i haven't started um the rest of my notes at all so this might take a little bit of a while to get to you but um let me know what your thoughts are was this what you expected based on what you have heard about the book were you expecting something different for me i hadn't read this book since middle school so this was kind of a trip for me but yeah team simon or team jace leave your thoughts below anyway so yeah i'm gonna end this now and um i'll see you guys in the next next episode mortal instruments city of bones i'm out <laughs>